to all nine of the people in this room and <laughs> to everyone online. I'm Stacy Lutkus. Um, on your screen are Sebastian Vandenberg and Pete Bowden. We're going to be speaking to you about REIT insolvencies um, from the US, the Australian, and the Netherlands perspective. Uh, Brandy, can you flip over to the next, the third slide, please? Um, and then, so uh, this is a, a brief outline of our program, which is, we'll start with a, a description of what a REIT is in each of the um, jurisdictions. We will um, we'll discuss insolvencies and we'll discuss restructurings. Um, in the United States, uh, the REIT structure, structure was enacted by Congress in 1960. Um, it was intended to provide small investors the opportunity to participate in um, large-scale institutional type real estate investment. Um, it's actually codified in the Internal Revenue Code. It's a, it's a, a tax structured uh, investment vehicle um, there and the structure provides for no federal income tax at the corporate level which is attractive for corporations it, it the earnings though have to pass through to shareholders um, there is a provision under the tax code that provides that 90 percent of otherwise taxable income has to be dividended out to shareholders um, and that you'll see we'll talk later, will um, create some interesting issues when it comes to the bankruptcy court. Um, the, uh, the other, the other um, characteristic that really will sort of cause an issue at times in, um, in connection with a REIT in the bankruptcy court is the 50% of shares held by five or few individuals. Um, that prompts many REITs to trade publicly. Um, so common shareholders, preferred shareholders are members of the investing public. Uh, very often, as we all know, uh, shareholders can be unsophisticated and and when unsophisticated shareholders come to represent themselves in bankruptcy court, um, it it can it can be interesting. Let's let's put it that way. Um, and I will pass it, the next slide on to Pete to talk about REITs in Australia. No worries. Thanks, Stacey. I hope everyone can hear me okay. So similar to other jurisdictions, what we're really talking about here is real estate investment trusts. In Australia, we often call them A-REITs, obviously being Australian real estate investment trusts. So effectively, we're talking about entities that own and manage portfolios of property uh, on behalf of unit holders. Uh, these were originally called listed property trusts on the basis that most of them were listed on the uh, Australian Stock Exchange in Australia. And the type of investment or property assets that they hold in Australia typically comprise commercial office buildings, shopping centres or shopping malls, as you would call them in the States, industrial properties, warehouses, hotels and hospitality venues, cinemas and healthcare properties such as hospitals and nursing homes. So, so really quite diverse. But in terms of structuring and how they work, they're effectively like a managed fund in that they're pooled investments overseen by a professional fund manager, which under the structure in Australia is called a responsible entity. Often, as I mentioned, they are listed on the Australian Stock Exchange in Australia. On that basis, they can be sold uh, and purchased through a broker the same way as shares can. They're generally in this jurisdiction considered to be a relatively stable investment and they offer both capital growth and income returns. So income annuity type returns, which can come from tenants paying rent, for example, as well as the capital growth over time uh, that can be associated with the property asset itself. Recently, uh, REITs in Australia, or A-REITs, have extended their mandates. So they now engage in a more sort of bespoke type 
transactions such as property development as opposed to just ownership and management. And they've also invested in some offshore property assets to get a greater diversification. In terms of the actual legal structure associated with REITs in Australia, they are effectively trusts. <laughs> it goes without saying. And in Australia, trusts are creatures of equity as opposed to creatures of, of, of statute. Uh, unlike a company, a trust itself is not a separate legal entity and the relationship governing, governing a trust is effectively contractual. So you have the trustee that has obligations to look after the beneficiaries and the relationships are incorporated in the trustee. So in the context of a, an A REIT in Australia, the trustee is generally a corporate entity and that has duties as a trustee, but the sort of overlay is also that the directors of that trustee entity have fiduciary duties as directors of a corporation. Uh, well, the trustee's duties are generally provided for in the trustee, the type of duties and responsibilities that they have are generally holding the assets for the REIT on behalf of the unit holders, protecting the unit holders' rights and ensuring compliance with the relevant laws. In terms of the sort of regulatory regime in Australia, and you'll see that hopefully from the slide up there, we have the general law, as I mentioned, relating to trust, equitable doctrines associated with trust, given they are a creature of statute, but also relatively recently in Australia, Chapter 5C of the Corporations Act applies with respect to REITs on the basis that they're governed as managed investment schemes under the Corporations Act. There's also ASX listing rules to the extent that the REITs are listed on the ASX. And if they are regulated under Chapter 5C on the basis that they provide offers to retail investors, there are some strict requirements that need to be complied with. They do need to be registered, have a constitution that's compliant, have an audited compliance plan, and the responsible entity must be a licensed public company. And there are quite strict governance requirements associated with that. And on the basis that they're offering the REITs to retail investors, they need to have a product disclosure statement. And there are quite strict ongoing compliance type obligations, such as disclosure and financial reporting requirements. I'm not going to touch on tax, but the taxation treatment associated with REITs in Australia is dependent on the type of structure and whether it's a stapled security or otherwise. I'll hand over to Sebastian to give you a bit of an overview as to the Dutch regime. Yeah, thank you, Pete. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman, also for the introduction. Uh, you see that, hopefully, Randy, that my slide is now on, and you see that the content of that slide in respect to Netherlands is extremely limited and that's because we don't know the trust as such i mean uh, we uh, uh, we do have tax regimes because we are the netherlands so everybody knows us because we are a tax haven uh, at least that's the, the 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 some the left wing of the government is believing that at the moment but uh, i mean we do have tax regimes that apply or that may apply if you uh, meet certain conditions to a uh, just a normal company so that, that's a little bit different compared to to the states and australia that we heard before but it's more that a certain tax regime may apply to uh, whatever uh, uh, company you're holding so a public company or or a private limited liability company and it also applies or can apply to mutual funds so that that looks more like the trust form more like the agreement um in the States, you, you have the famous FBI, and that's also the Dutch acronym for the tax regime that applies, uh, or that, that's the, the same name applies to the, to the, to the Netherlands, only is not the, the, the FBI as you know it uh, from the States. It's more uh, the, the, the summary or the translation of the financial investment institution. So that's the, that's the, the word we, uh, we use in Netherlands for the, for the REITs, but it's uh, internationally, it's sold as, a, as being equal to the REIT. So although we don't uh, have it as such, we do have fiscal regimes uh, that lead or create the same uh, fiscal result um, as, as in, in, in foreign countries. Well, looking at the conditions or the uh, requirements, the statutory requirements in order to qualify as a FBI, so a Dutch FBI or a a Dutch financial investment institution, uh, there I, I distinguish uh, three elements. The first is 
And I'm wondering, uh, that's also directly a question for Pete and Stacy, because I think it will be interesting to see when we touch upon the uh, restructuring part uh, and, and the insolvency part of this, this, this panel. I think it's interesting to see what the difference is in respect of this element. And this element has to do with leverage. Um, for in order to, to qualify as an, as an FBI, you, uh, uh, or, or the, the REIT in the Netherlands, let, I will use REIT going forward, but in order to qualify as such, you are not uh, allowed to finance your company externally, so debt, debt financing, with more than 60% of the book value of the real estate, which is in that REIT. And that's, uh, I'm not sure whether that's conservative or not. I can imagine that uh, in, in, in case uh, uh, environment changes as they do today in real estate, that, uh, that it will be more uh, uh, risky or not, depending on what the threshold uh, is. So that's, that's the first element. Second one has to do with the shareholders, uh, the shareholders base. That's more or less the same, or at least, uh, 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 more or less the same in, in the US, I, I, I just heard about looking at the, the, the composition of, of the shareholder base and then uh, uh, specifically in terms of how many individuals there may be. Well, you, you in order to qualify as a REIT in the Netherlands, you're not allowed or no individual natural person may hold more than 25%. And that's for the listed companies that want to qualify as a REIT. And for the unlisted companies uh, that want to qualify as a REIT, you are not even allowed to have a significant uh, shareholding interest. And what we mean by significant shareholding interest is already more than 5%. So no individual may then uh, hold more than 5% of the shares in the listed uh, REIT. The third element uh, or the third statutory requirement in order to qualify as a REIT uh, has to do with, uh, I, we heard it already, distributing your income and 90% uh, uh, has to be distributed in the States, we just heard it. Well, it's more that in the in Netherlands you have to distribute within eight months after the end of the fiscal year. Uh, and then you have to distribute among your uh, your shareholders and their, yeah, the advantage, and we will not elaborate about uh, about the tax elements uh, of, of the of the REITs in, in other countries, but then you are not uh, obliged to pay corporate income tax. Uh, but profit distributions are then still subject to the 15% uh, Dutch withholding tax. So that's that's basically in a nutshell how we uh, what we do or what we uh, understand to be REITs under a Dutch law perspective. So, so to summarize. We don't have as such, as such because we don't know the trust in our Dutch uh, legal system. However, you can still apply or create the same uh, effect as, as in foreign countries where you do have the, the trust because we know the uh, FBI, so the, the uh, financial or the fiscal investor uh, investment institution. So that's that's about it for, uh, for the introduction uh, in respect of the read from a U.S., Australian, and Dutch respect. So I have a question for both um, Sebastian and Pete, and it is based on what I heard and what I know about U.S. REITs, and that, well, first, um, so in the United States, a REIT must derive 75% of its adjusted gross income from passive investment, and the passive investment can be in real estate equity, or real estate secured debt. Um, and so what has happened in the REIT industry here is that these very sort of complex corporate structures have grown up out of that particular requirement under the tax code. And so um, what you'll often see is a company that is qualified as a REIT under the tax code. And then that company will directly own an operating partnership. And so the REIT qualifies as a REIT. The operating partnership actually operates the business 
and then the operating partnership will own a number of subsidiaries that are special purpose entities that own the direct properties. And those special purpose entities that are in the, often indirectly owned by the REIT or always indirectly owned by the REIT because the REIT has to be a passive investor. Um, those are the entities that incur the secured debt in the corporate structure. And I'm just wondering how that works in, in, in Australia and the Netherlands. No, I'm, 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 yeah. There are similar issues that grow up out of the corporate structure. I, I might jump in first. I, I think it's really interesting to sort of contrast with the US position, which seems to be really prescriptive. And from what I'm gathering, I think that's on the basis that it appears to be a very tax driven structure and the concept of a rate itself, I think under American law is actually a legal term, if, if, if I'm getting it correct. Whereas the Australian position doesn't have a strict kind of oversight or prescriptive definitions as to what constitute a rate. And in fact, a rate is not necessarily a thing. It's just something we talk about. It's not a legal term. So those kind of prescriptive terminology under Australian law don't apply. And there's no kind of tax structuring or tax concept of a rate. So uh, very, very different, I guess, from the US position. It may be that we're 20 years behind the US, which we ordinarily are in normal circumstances. So it may be something that we develop over time, but our structures are relatively straightforward. I mean, there's some complex underlying transactions that underpin the trust assets, for example. But effectively, we just have a responsible entity that is quite heavily governed. And that's the entity that incurs the debt. So any secured debt would effectively be over that particular entity, as well as fixed assets that are located in the trust. And I'll sort of get to that when we talk about from an enforcement perspective. But in terms of sort of layering and structuring at the sort of responsible entity level, that, that, that just doesn't happen. It's very straightforward. It's one entity that acts in that capacity and they then have the right of indemnity out of the trust assets, uh, but certainly not as prescriptive as what you uh, have in the, in the States. And so having, having described that, is there, um, I, I, can I assume or can we assume that there's no specific requirement with respect to what assets the the REIT can own. I, I mean, I'll call it a REIT, but you yeah. can call it the responsible party or the responsible person. Is there a, a requirement for the types of assets or what the asset mix can or cannot be? No, there's not, there's not. So, so really the requirements on the basis that the assets are offered up to retail investors, the requirements center around disclosure and governance and those type of uh, rationale. So I think, I think it, got, it comes down to the fact that we don't actually have that specific defined concept of a rate. So there's no specifics around what you must hold or what you aren't allowed to hold in order to qualify on that basis. So it's a very broad structure in Australia and um, really the law and the sort of terminology revolves more around trust law, to be honest. And so there's quite prescriptive requirements around offering and being on the ASX and disclosure and those type of things, but they more relate to the fact that you're offering it out to retail investors as opposed to the actual structuring itself. So in a roundabout way to answer your question, it's, it's very, very different. Yeah, and perhaps I can add from, from my perspective. Uh, we more or less have the same, uh, Stacey, <clears throat> because we do have the uh, pre uh, prescriptions or requirements. I mean, on a consolidated level, so because it's, it sounds really, really familiar that you put your assets in the, in the separate SPVs, etc. But from a, in a Dutch uh, context, from a consolidated level, it's not 75%, but we need actually 90% uh, that has to be uh, real estate. So you, you can have a subsidiary who is providing the, the, the services to, to, for real estate, et cetera, uh, rent collection or uh, uh, all kind of other stuff that has to do with, with real estate and the development thereof. But that can only be rather limited because it really needs to be passive, as you indicated. And uh, yeah, we are a little bit more strict about the percentage. So on a consolidated level, it's, it's even 90%, if, if that answers your, uh, your question. And, and I guess just going back to Sebastian's 
earlier question, which I think was you asked about, or you, you talked about the, the FBI and yeah. the fact that um, an FBI in the, in the Netherlands is not allowed to finance greater than 60% of the book value of the assets. Yeah. Um, so I think, it, so in the United States, I don't think that this, well, I, I will say that I don't think there's a regulation as to the, the leverage for secure debt, and that is because all of the re bankruptcies recently that we have seen have seen very high um, debt numbers versus the the enterprise value of of the business. Um, but I I will say that. Um, much of the secured debt, like I described in the United States, is usually at the property level, special purpose entity. I mean, let's just say for, for the sake of this example that you have a mall REIT. If you have the, the REIT at the top of the corporate structure, then you have the operating partnership that owns the subsidiaries that in turn own the real estate. Um, it's each of the subsidiaries that that will incur the debt. There is secured debt at the top of the, the structure often, and, and usually what, how that works is the operating partnership will, um, will borrow um, and will pledge its stock in special purpose entities that own real estate, but don't have their own debt on that real estate. Um, it's it's a it's complicated and and parties get pretty creative with respect to the financing. REITs also um, traditionally use the bond markets in the United States to raise capital, um, and so if you're going into an insolvency situation and and we'll get to I'll get to more of this later in the presentation, but um, there will often be a, a bond group that for lack of a better term, gets to drive the bus. And Pete, how does it, how does it work in Australia? Is there a limitation on borrowing for, by the responsible person? No, there's no sort of statutory limitations. Obviously they'd be limited to the extent that they can pledge their assets uh, that would be set out in the, in the trust and um, you know, the ability to leverage off that, but there's no statutory requirements around that. Um, it's pretty conservative in, in the Australian market in terms of leverage. So LBRs would play would play a key part. Um, Property is a very safe asset in Australia, and REITs are considered a very sort of long term safe asset as well. So they have relatively conservative gearing. But yeah, there's no sort of statutory requirements on what they can and can't borrow. Okay. Okay. So we'll turn now to the topic of REIT insolvencies. Um, in the United States, bankruptcy filings by REITs are actually pretty rare. There was, um, so as I described, the structure was enacted by Congress in 1960. Um, in the late 1960s, it took, it took a good decade for the REIT concept to take off. Um, initially, the, the holdings were small the dividends were small, the money was small, so investors just sort of weren't interested. Um, as the holdings grew, as the dividends grew, as the portfolios grew, investors became more interested, um, started investing, and everybody started setting up REITs. Um, I was surprised to learn that in the 70s, it wasn't uncommon for the big banks to set up um, a REIT arm for real estate investing. Um, invest, those, those REIT arms of the, the big banks generally invested in mortgage trusts. Um, but by the end of the 70s or um, mid to late 70s, there was a real estate slump in the United States um, and these REITs were heavily invested in, um, in development projects, high-risk de construction development projects. So um, 
they eventually defaulted those projects. Um, interest rates shot up in the United States in the mid to late 70s. Um, and ultimately the REITs couldn't make their loan payments, which resulted in a, a large number of filings under the Bankruptcy Act in the mid to late 70s. Um, between that sort of explosion of, of REIT filings in the 70s, and 2009, when General Growth Properties filed here in the Southern District of New York, um, there were very few re bankruptcy filings. Um, and when General Growth filed in 2009, in April, it was the largest real estate bankruptcy ever filed at that time. Um, General Growth, uh, after general growth, the, the, the re filing slowed down again. And recently we've seen more filings um, by REITs with substantial exposure to distressed industries. Retail REITs, um, shopping malls or shopping centers as you call them in Australia. Um, hospitality REITs, um, industries that that were affected by the COVID-19 pandemic, but also, um, as we all know, the, the retail and industry was sort of in a, a tailwind pre-pandemic um, and just pandemic closures sort of just put it over the edge. And, and the recent filings have largely been from the real estate industry. I'm sorry, from the, the mall and retail industry. Um, and so I think we'll go to the next slide now and Pete will tell us, talk about uh, insolvencies in Australia. Yeah, no worries, thank you. Look, similar themes in Australia there. Insolvencies of REITs are infrequent, particularly compared with general corporate insolvencies, notwithstanding insolvencies across the border uh, are very much down at the moment. But it's interesting because we refer to REITs as being insolvent, but from a legal perspective, on the basis that the Corporations Act defines insolvency and the Corporations Act governs corporations as opposed to trusts, it's actually technically impossible for a REIT in Australia itself to be insolvent. So really, it's the responsible entity that is insolvent on the basis that it and only it can incur debts on behalf of the trust assets and, and encumber the trust assets. So on that basis, trust property is held and the debts are incurred by the RA and the responsible entity has a right of indemnity from the trust property in respect of those debts. So an insolvent REIT therefore describes a REIT in which the trust property is insufficient to meet the liabilities to creditors, whether or not the RA itself is in fact solvent. And there are a few reasons why REIT insolvencies in Australia are relatively rare. The first is really that a trust itself and a, and a REIT for that matter is, is really an insolvency remote vehicle. So they are structured to avoid insolvency and there's all sorts of provisions in the documentation which support that. So for example, the responsible entity is not really able from a legal perspective to incur debts that they can't uh, pay and there are quite restrictive covenants around what they can and can't do. So on that basis, purely from a structural perspective, it is quite rare for REITs to become insolvent. Notwithstanding what I said before around the technical kind of nuance that they can't actually be insolvent. Second, there is a very heavy regulatory environment and that's not around, as I mentioned, the definition of REITs itself. It's really around how the responsible entity operates. And this was introduced in 1998 and effectively it governs REITs and classifies them as managed investment schemes under the Corporations Act. We had a wave of insolvencies in the agricultural managed investment scheme after the global financial crisis and almost wiped out the entire sector, but the REIT sector certainly didn't suffer the same consequences as the agricultural sector did. There are also a number of steps that can be taken in respect of REITs when they're in financial difficulty. So they can divest assets, they can undertake rights issues, private placements, uh, they're also subject to the, a takeover offer or a merger and acquisition. So they, there is quite uh, optionality in respect of them on the basis that we're dealing with quite familiar hard assets 
that investors are very, very comfortable for. So another reason why they uh, reap insolvencies are quite uncommon is that they are statutorily obliged to maintain certain cash and liquid assets, and therefore they are required to remain solvent. Now we say that about all companies, but these kind of stricter requirements around the governance of managed investment schemes and responsible entities means that it's quite uh, unlikely for them to become insolvent. But I think the main reason why we've seen very few REIT insolvencies in Australia is just the strength of the property sector in Australia. Uh, people in Australia like to own their own home, but property prices have seen a very steady increase. Certainly during my lifetime, there's barely been a year with even been a dip in property value. So on that basis, it's a very kind of comfortable asset class. And to the extent that they're governed properly, it's, it's relatively unlikely that they're going to face financial difficulty. Now, there are obviously reasons why they might. There might be tax consequences. There might be bad actors. There might be loss of value. There might be, you know, earthquakes or, you know, force majeure events and those types of things. So we can never say that they're a completely safe asset, but they have proved to be very robust in our jurisdiction, you know, over the course of the last 20 or so years. Having said that, there are a couple of reasonably prominent examples of REITs getting into insolvent situations. The first is Centro Properties, which was an enormous restructure just at the back of the global financial crisis. Really the driver of the situation here was the reclassification by the auditor of Centro in relation to tax liabilities. So they were classifying tax liabilities as long-term, whereas in fact they were short-term and a reclassification effectively put it into default under its banking facilities. And that was ultimately structured or restructured through a solvent scheme of arrangement. And I'll talk about some of the restructuring options. But that, that's a really good example, I think, because it just demonstrates that it was quite a significant event for it to actually find itself in financial difficulty. And that was a you know, very prominent accounting firm uh, making some errors that ultimately resulted in them being sued. The, the other example from an Australian perspective is Rubicon Asset Management, and this was in 2009, and this was uh, an insolvent uh, responsible entity that was placed in administration. Again, it was a sort of multitude of factors that led to its demise, but, but in this case, it was the um, decrease in assets of, of the values that were held in the trust. Ultimately, it wasn't able to be restructured uh, and, and it was, uh, there was a, a proposed deed of company arrangement and I'll talk about that in the restructuring section, but that failed and ultimately the trust assets were uh, liquidated uh, and unfortunately it wasn't able to be saved in those circumstances. So just, just a couple of broad examples, but uh, yeah, I hope you got a bit of a feel for why under the Australian regime, it is quite unlikely for REITs to find themselves in financial difficulty, mainly around those sort of economic and social factors that I mentioned. Sebastian, over to you. Sorry, sorry, Pete. But before no we go on to uh, Sebastian in the Netherlands, I have a fun fact, and that is that I actually worked on Central Properties Group restructuring in the United States. The United States arm of Centro, and this, this goes to what we were talking about earlier with respect to these complex corporate structures, but um, in the United States, Central Properties Group was composed of 108 potential debtors um, and, and ultimately ended up being able to restructure out of court. Um, but several years later, um, I, I guess it was two years later was when they ultimately um, were able to restructure the Australian arm um, via their, their scheme of arrangement. But um, the, the, my fondest memory of, of the central restructuring was the CFO's delightful Australian accent. He, sounds just, he sounded just like Pete. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Not like me. So, um, it, so uh, Sebastian, in in the Netherlands, you yeah, we don't have a we do, yeah, we don't have a slide for for these examples, and for the same reason as as Pete indicated, they are very rare. Um, what I and that, that everything has to do, I think, also with with the uh, with the with the, with, the, with the with the booming real estate market uh, and the loan to value ratios that we discussed before. 
uh, what we have seen over the last couple of years that there's a huge inflow of capital. I mean, uh, Blackstone owns, I would not say half of Amsterdam, but they own a tremendous amount of house, houses in, the, in, the, in Amsterdam. And there are a lot of other investors that invested in Netherlands for, uh, for residential uh, housing projects as well. And I mean, the market is good at the moment. And, and, and as long as that stays uh, that way, then I don't expect that we are going to see a lot of uh, read insolvencies as such. And again, it, it would then not be a read insolvency. It would just be a regular, normal uh, bankruptcy as we, as we know it uh, in, in, as we have yeah, under the normal regimes that we have in the Netherlands. So no special regime applies to, to a read or a non-read it's, it's all the same and you just you just end up in the normal insolvency procedures i uh, I, uh, I i have to say it, it's now uh looking at the, the clock we still have 15 minutes and uh i'm not sure unless my q chat is not extremely or is not up to or accurate but i'm not sure whether there are any questions i think we have to move on to the third uh, part of the uh of the uh, presentation, don't you agree? All right, Sebastian, moving us along. <laughs> um, the, uh, the, the issues that you'll see, so in the United States, when you have a REIT that, that has filed and, and is in bankruptcy case, the, the two main issues that you'll see are lender issues and shareholder issues, not very different from your general run-of-the-mill Chapter 11 in cases that can arise. Um, Lender issues are, are interesting, and in, in recent cases, um, in, in two recent cases, one um, is CBL and Associates bankruptcy. Um, it looks like we lost our slides on the screen. But um, in, in two recent cases in the United States, there have been lender issues where the lenders have asserted bad faith. Um, one is CBL and Associates Properties, Inc., and that is an entity that um, owns a portfolio of shopping malls across the United States, and they currently are in Chapter 11 in the Southern District of Texas. Um, full disclosure, I represent the Official Committee of Unsecured Creditors in that case. Nothing I'm about to say is non-public. Um, the, the assertion of bad faith in that case was from the lender Wells Fargo, who um, prior to the chapter 11 filing, when the debtor was negotiating with Wells Fargo with secured lenders, as well as its ad hoc group of note holders holding a, who hold um, north of two thirds of the outstanding issue of the, the company's secured, unsecured notes. Um, the, uh, the negotiation, negotiations were such that the company um, sort of took, took its time getting to the negotiations with the bank. And they, they were negotiating with both parties simultaneously, and they negotiated with um, the bondholders. They were trying to restructure out of court. They were trying to put together a prepack. Um, when the when they the company reached a restructuring support agreement with its bondholders, um, the bondholders then presented a term sheet to Wells Fargo. What Wells Fargo did in response to the term sheet was to exercise its rights under its um, loan documents and install itself as management in the special purpose entities that many of the special purpose entities that secured its debt. Um, and so when, and, and took a series of actions like telling the tenants not to pay their rent to CBL, to pay their rent to, to Wells Fargo. Um, and when CBL filed its chapter 11 case, including the 20, I think it was 22 entities that secured the Wells Fargo debt. Um, Wells Fargo asserted in the bankruptcy court that the, the case was filed in bad faith. 
Um, so the bad faith, that bad faith allegation led to several months of litigation. Um, the parties ultimately um, ended up settling their differences in mediation and, and a, a plan was confirmed in that case in just this past August. But um, the, the interesting issue that arose out of that litigation was whether or not Wells Fargo was entitled to exercise its lender remedies, which the debtors disputed. Um, the, once it inserted itself in management in those 22 entities that ultimately became debtors in the bankruptcy, management was required to act in the best interests of each of those entities and not in the best interests of Wells Fargo. Um, and that was the assertion by the debtors in that litigation and it would have been interesting to see it play out, but ultimately the parties decided, after a couple of days of trial, the parties decided to give mediation a try and we will never know what the outcome will be. Um, I think we are rapidly running out of time and this always happens. So to ensure that we get a full perspective from the Netherlands and Australia, I will, we will turn it over to Pete for the next slide. No worries, I'll try and be as quick as possible on this section. Uh, just noting the, the prior comment in Australia that insolvency is quite rare, rare in the REIT space. There are various ways in which the companies can find themselves subject to an insolvency appointment. So by example, while there are restrictions on the board uh, in terms of the debt they can uh, incur under the basis of the trustee uh, will normally set out their obligations and their inability to incur debt over and above what the trust assets are worth. There are circumstances where those debts balloon and they find themselves in uh, financial difficulty. We have quite draconian laws in Australia in respect of insolvent trading and directors can be personally liable and they can even go to jail in extreme circumstances. So in some instances, and this was the case in, in Rubicon, the directors themselves can appoint an administrator and that can hopefully affect a restructure through what's called a deed of company arrangement under our regime and I'll circle back to that quickly, but otherwise it ends up in liquidation if they can't find a, a proper proponent in respect of that type of restructure. Also, when a, a REIT is in financial difficulty on the basis that some of the assets in the trust have been pledged to specific secured lenders, those lenders can appoint a receiver. So that counterparty can actually go in and realise those assets purely for the benefit of the secured parties. So there are various ways in which the REIT can find itself subject to an insolvency appointment. From a restructuring perspective as well, there are two uh, effective regimes you know, under Australian law that uh, REITs can utilise. And the first is what's called a deed of company arrangement, which is basically a compromise between the company and its creditors. And this is one of the potential outcomes of a voluntary administration under Australian law. So using Rubicon as an example, there was a deed of company arrangement proposed and effectively that needs to provide a better return than a liquidation in order for it to be voted upon by creditors in a simple majority in value and in number. And ordinarily for a REIT that would involve another entity coming in and becoming the responsible entity. So the deed of company arrangement proposal would effectively be put to creditors and the basis of that would be a new, uh, properly governed um, with all the, the, with the relevant laws uh, complied with and that would basically displace the outgoing responsible entity. And that would be utilised through the deed of company arrangement regime, which, as I mentioned, is one of the outcomes of the voluntary administration. That wasn't successful in Rubicon, but it is an effective means in which a REIT can be restructured. The other way is through a scheme of arrangement, and that's what we saw in Centro, and that can either be a solvent or an insolvent restructure. It's an, a court-driven process, so it requires two court hearings, and it requires each class of creditors to vote in favour of it. But it's a very effective way to implement a restructure, whether that be a debt for equity swap or just a debt forgiveness. And given it has the court imprimatur associated with it, it's a very secure way in which to do it so that it's not subject to challenge later on. I just wanted to touch on those potential two mechanisms. And again, appreciate we're running tight on time. So I'll, I'll hand over to Sebastian to give a summary of the 
uh, restructuring mechanisms under Dutch law. Yeah, great, thanks. We included a lot of slides about this uh, this new Dutch scheme, which uh, has entered into force on uh, January 1 this year. Uh, but that's basically background reading for if you're still awake during the day. We uh, So we have a new law. We finally have our scheme out of formal bankruptcy proceedings. Uh, and the scheme, we uh, the, the idea was not to directly comply with the European Restructuring Directive, but it actually is in compliance with it. And the uh, great part about it is that it's extremely flexible, extremely swift and uh, uh, swift procedure. I mean, Pete already indicated that they have two hearings with, with their scheme. Well, we only have one hearing. So it can really uh, it can really be a very quick procedure in and out. And I expect that in the day, I mean, I mean there is another uh, session, panel session about the uh, uh, latest developments. And I, I expect that uh, Professor uh, Sala from the Netherlands, who is uh, just or will be enacted tonight or in, in, is he is in the in the latest class, I, I expect that he will touch about the uh, new Dutch scheme as well. What I just want to mention over here for this, this panel session, because we have to uh, round the circle and come back to the reads is that uh, we have under that new Dutch scheme an extremely large uh, basis for jurisdiction. There are two tracks, a public track, uh, which is basically under the uh, European uh, insolvency regulation and a private track. And that private track, you don't need Comey for it. So, and the, you, you basically need a what the, what the English call a sufficient connection. And that can also mean that you end up with domicile of the creditor. So if you, for example, uh, have a, a, a U.S. read and uh, which is which is governed by by U.S. debt and the, the, the creditor is in, in the States, you can simply transfer part of that debt position to an, Dutch and SPV and enter into the new Dutch scheme. I mean, that would be sufficient connection for a Dutch judge to order that he has jurisdiction to follow this extremely swift route. And what do you get then? What is the Dutch team scheme? Well, it's basically a combination of the, the UK scheme of arrangement and the uh, chapter 11 proceedings, but not the extensive uh, way, in, in, not in the extensive way that that's uh, that, uh, that 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 received comments. Uh, uh, I mean, I mean, chapter eleven is very costly, very long, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And we try to take all those uh, disadvantages away and try to create a very swift procedure, without uh, taking away the underlying thought of distributing the reorganization value uh, in the priority or what you call the absolute priority. Uh, so that's what uh, what has been in, implemented since January 1st. Uh, we have seen a lot of liquidation uh, schemes, uh, but we are also involved with a very relatively uh, big one then, uh, restructuring case. And again, very broad grounds for jurisdiction. Also in terms of recognition, Dutch literature uh, has already indicated, and perhaps Professor Sala, who was also an author of one of the articles, um, we'll touch upon that later today, uh, but there's also, um, uh, it's very much likely that we'll simply be recognized also under chapter 15 uh, in the States. So <clears throat> I, uh, I encourage everyone who, uh, who is involved with, with, with foreign reads to try to see whether this new Dutch scheme fits into your restructuring toolbox. Um, I, I think we still have uh, two minutes left for any uh, questions without us or, or any questions without answers, uh, but let's see how the what uh, what the audience uh, whether there are any questions from the audience, uh, Stacy. There are no questions from the live audience. Great. No but um, they're still there. I, I yeah. will I will take the next minute and thirty seconds to point out that yesterday when we were rehearsing this presentation, one of the interesting things that came up when Sebastian was talking about the friendliness of the 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 Dutch to foreign reads is um, the juxtaposition of that versus a situation in the United States in the Eagle Hospitality Group Inc bankruptcy that um, was filed in Delaware, um, the, the entities that first filed were subsidiaries of a Singapore REIT. 
Um, later, the, the debtors filed the Singapore entity, and going back to our, our bad faith discussion from a few minutes ago, the, um, the lender, in that case, Bank of America, um, alleged bad faith for the filing of the Singapore entity because this, under the bankruptcy code, in order for a trust to qualify as a debtor, um, it has to be a business trust. And the Bank of America asserted that the, the Singapore entity did not qualify as a business trust and therefore did not qualify as a, um, a debtor under the chap under chapter 11. Um, the, the, that I'm getting cut off here, but I will say that the United States, uh, although the, the Singapore entity was able to stay in, in chapter 11, uh, the United States is decidedly less friendly than um, what we have learned about the Netherlands. So thank you to our panelists. I was told that uh, the CLE code was not mentioned in the chat. So for those of you uh, watching remotely, the code is R-E-N-1. That is R-E-N-1. Um, we'll have a 10 minute break. 